guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. I hope you're all doing well and that your gardens are surviving what I'm guessing is a lot of heat. Everybody seems to be... Did you see in London, in England, mm -hmm. uh, the temp? They got over 100. It was like 104, uh, 40 degrees Celsius for them. But um, like, hot they them. don't have AC. Mm -hmm. and that's like a once in a lifetime, probably more than once oh. in a lifetime kind of heat. We can escape it at least. Well, here. we're, you know, every area is built, you know, like uh, we're not built for rain. Like everything would flood here because uh -huh. we don't, we, you know, you don't have to plan for a way for the water to go. Mm -hmm. um, we're not built for snow. No. You know, like you just go up to McCall, which is a couple hours away mm -hmm. and all the roofs are pitched like this because yeah. they get a ton of snow. Right. You know? So every area is just used to their thing. Well, we're built for heat. Yeah, we're for built sure. for heat for the yeah. most part. Yeah. We have 108 on the forecast two days next week, mm -hmm. which it hasn't, I think it's gotten close to that over the last few years. I remember when I worked out at the garden center, um, I remember the thermometer reading 100 and, and like, I think it was a little over 108. It was like 110, mm, yeah, something like that. And I remember just, my mom was like, just go water what you have to water and then get into the shade somewhere. Yeah. Um, so anyway. One whoo, year when yeah. I was working at the cable company, um, I was working on power supplies, which are those like, metal boxes on the side of the road and mm -hmm. they they keep the cable running in case of a power outage. They have like car batteries inside of them. But anyway, um, it was over 110 and I was just thinking to myself like, why? What am I doing working what? in a little like metal box <laughs> right. in 110? This what makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> and like in hindsight, I probably should have had like a shade because you just sit there and work on those boxes. Right. You really should set up one of those like pop-up pop -up tents yeah. or a you know shade of some kind. How long did you have to sit there though? Um, well, I think you, ch you were supposed to like clean out and organize like two a day uh -huh. was kind of like the, the going the rate, uh -huh. you know? And, um, so yeah, <sighs> but I mean, it's an eight hour gig. So you're just sitting there and cleaning the parts and cleaning uh, all the connections. Do you miss it? Uh, there's parts of it that I miss, uh -huh. but, but not that part. Not that part. <laughs> I'm guessing. Okay, let's jump into the videos from last week. The first one was planting fall crops plus a few more warm season crops. So uh, we had cleaned out all of the raised beds that had things that were spent and done. And I was ready to plant some more things like a short day pumpkin. I planted zucchini, cucumbers. Um, I planted uh, snow peas, carrots, some herbs. I am waiting on a few things because it's just still too hot for some things to germinate, but like even the carrots are up and doing great. Cilantro's up, uh, parsley's up, no basil's up, parsley's a little slow, um, but everything's looking pretty good so far. Betty said, good morning from Delaware, Georgia friends. Laura, hope your mom is doing better. Prayers for a speedy recovery. Oh, I meant to update you on that anyway. My mom went in for surgery yesterday morning. Everything went swimmingly smashing yeah, yeah. Um, it went really well uh, she was in really good spirits of course because you know you're just one step closer to being done with the whole thing and when it's an unexpected accident like that that happens like you're just wanting it to be done mm -hmm. just you know and especially my mom is so active and you know but we've all been you know taking care of her making her rest and chill and also, uh, my mom did want me to tell everybody thank you so much, so many of you, and thank you from me too. So many of you have reached out and sent thank you cards and gifts and just made her feel so loved and um, supported you know, during this. And, and when you're a person who is extroverted like my mom and likes to you know, be out and about and doing things and chatting with people, to be homebound like that can be really kind of isolating and kind of, it can be a little sad. I mean, I think she makes it makes positive of pretty much anything that she's like anything that's thrown at her but it sure makes it nice all of the support you guys have given her so thank you and she wanted me to tell you thank you as well kathy said will you show seed saving for tomatoes did you see or you did a seed saving video about a year ago but no tomatoes in that one you know i did not do any seed saving in tomatoes because i plant so many varieties and so many that are um like the cross i, I have no idea what i would get uh, should i try to harvest those seeds and then replant them. So I usually start with fresh seeds. Um, there are lots of videos though on it that you can check out. I mean, you can take the seeds out, you soak them in water and like, I think the bad ones float and the good ones stay to the bottom and then you strain them out and dry them. And it's pretty, it's a pretty straightforward process really. Monica said, I just have one question. I have to move and I wanted to know how I can dig up without killing the Rose of Sharon. Well, I don't, how old is your Rose of Sharon? Um, at what time are you are you moving right now when it's super hot? It's riskier 
the hotter it is. It's riskier the more established your plant is. So if you're wanting to move it, you can still try. I mean, you're not out anything, I suppose, except for your time and maybe a little bit of angst mm. <laughs> about the situation. Uh, just try to dig up as big of a root ball as you can and keep that thing hydrated. Like even hydrate it before you dig it. Water it really well and make the root ball heavy, but it'll eliminate a little bit, hopefully eliminate a little bit of shock and then plant it as soon as you can. Uh, Rochelle said, do you just intuitively know what each seed type needs for germination? No. So many seed packets do not advise on temperatures or light needs. I know, and I find that so disappointing. That's why I order so many of my seeds. Like People probably think we partner with Johnny Seeds. Yeah. We don't. We've never worked with Johnny Seeds. Um, I just Do love... you know anybody that works there? Nope. Oh. Uh-uh. I just I feel like they have such a massive variety for such a better price than most everybody else mm -hmm. um, markets them for. I mean, you can find specialty zinnias on somebody's website that charges an arm and a leg for like 15 seeds, or you can get like 50 seeds or 100 seeds from Johnny's for a really comparable price to that 15 seed price. Anyway, um, and then their, their packets aren't anything to look at in terms of there's no picture, there's no color, tons of information, all kinds of growing requirements, um, cultural information, all of that not cultural, culture information. Um, anyway, I just, I find that so invaluable and it's actually the information on the back of the seed packets that I feel like has made me successful with certain types of seed that mm -hmm. like I would never have started covering my seeds with vermiculite had I not read it on some of their packets. And I don't do it on like 100% of everything, but on a lot of things. And I feel like it's a really good way to, to do it. Um, I'm struggling to germinate lettuce consistently of all things. Is there a good resource you recommend? Um, again, Johnny's is a great resource because you can find all that growing information on their website, but lettuce has a real struggle germinating over 75 degrees. So that could be your issue if you're warmer than that right now. That's why I've waited. I'm not going to plant any of my lettuce or greens or anything like that until a little bit later just because I'll have a heck of a time without shading it. And even then, it's just so hot right now. I think it would really have a, a struggle. Be Well Farm said, what size gravel do you have in the veggie garden? We are redoing our garden area using Vego. Is it Vigo? Vego? Veggio. V-E-G-O. I don't what, know. Would you like veg? Veg beds? Veggio beds? Oh, is that what it is? I don't know. Veggio. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> I'm getting too old to pull weeds. Uh, we have three quarter inch chip gravel uh, in our vegetable garden. We do have landscape fabric only under the walking paths, not underneath the raised beds for those of you who might wonder. So we did lay out, it's the DeWitt Pro, it's the only kind of landscape fabric. If we use it, which we very limited, do we ever use it? I think we are gonna use it in the pathways around the Hartley though, because it has eliminated so much headache in that raised bed area because we know it's gonna be a pathway forever. We're not going to be taking that garden up anytime ever. I've, am I planning to move that garden or do anything different in that garden? I love the layout. It's worked really well for us. So uh, we put the DeWitt Pro down, put our raised beds down, and then cut the landscape fabric out from under the raised beds, and then put the three quarter inch chip on top. And it works really well, and it's a, not a round gravel, it's a chip, is that mm -hmm. the right word? So it's got like irregular flat edges, and it really kind of locks together pretty easily, so it's really easy to walk on. You don't feel like you're kind of like, you're gonna Part roll Part of that too ankle. is I think you have to get just the right amount of it. Like if you do too much, you kind of start swimming in it. Yeah. Um, so you need like sure. just enough to cover the fabric to where you don't see the fabric, right. not too much to where you start, you know, swimming. Yeah. We've never had to replace any gravel in there or add any gravel in there. I have no idea how even thick that is. Not that thick, like, like that yeah, maybe? Not a lot. Yeah, not a lot at all. Uh, Ashley said, I didn't hear you mention anything about Brussels sprouts. Do you not grow those? I do on occasion, only to catch the aphids. I'm not a huge fan of Brussels sprouts. I don't know about you. Are you I don't know. No. I don't. Yeah. I've never really had them prepared, I guess, the way that I like them that, yeah. that much. I'd rather just have regular cabbage. They're a little bit too, like, potent. Maybe I've just had the, like, harvested them at the wrong time or yeah. I don't know how to cook them or that's very likely. Uh, but I do plant them on occasion because they are funny to look at. Like, they're a funny looking plant and it's kind of fun to show kids or you know people that you have over to your garden that plant but they also are an amazing host plant for aphids so if you want to uh, plant a garden that you don't want to use any insecticides whatsoever plant calendula and plant brussels sprouts and you will never have an aphid problem on any of your other brassicas cabbage bro uh, broccoli cauliflower all of those things they usually stay completely clean because the aphids love 
those other two plants. In fact, we pulled the zeolites calendula finally in the raised beds, mm -hmm. the stuff that seeded itself because it was just loaded with aphids. And it was so loaded that I kind of thought, oh, well, we got to get this out of here at this point. Like it's yeah. going to start weighing down with the weight <laughs> of the aphids. So we cleaned that out and I might just water it and let more calendula come back up. H.J. Carpentier said, I have a question about wicking. Is it the soil that wicks it up or the roots of the plant? How does soil wick up the water when there's only seeds? Uh, I think it's the oxygen levels in the soil. I think that there's something about that. The soil wicks up the moisture. Of course, once your plant is established and has more roots, it will draw up moisture as it needs it. Um, but I believe it's a soil thing. That's an oxygen exchange yeah. thing. Like it can sense when there's oxygen in the soil and pulls up moisture. Yeah. I don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. Well, I think um, I think the reason that like they use peat in or have in the past used peat a lot in soil mixtures is that I think that is like a really good wick. Um, I seem to remember somebody talking about that. And then if peat dries out though, it actually can repel. So like if you ever noticed if you've if you've got a really dry container and you put the you know put water on it, mm -hmm. sometimes it's almost like it won't actually get it, it like wet. It goes to the sides. Yeah, it goes, it goes to goes the down. sides. Yeah. So you really have to like saturate it hard if mm -hmm. it's dried out completely. So you have mm -hmm. to make sure that it's constantly a little bit moist. Right. Um, but now peat, they're not using as much. Right. Um, what are they using? Like cocoa? Like cocoa, coconut core or coke. Yeah. Right. Is it just that peat's like a non-renewable, mm -hmm. um, like peat bogs? Is yeah. that where it comes from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess like, what is it? it? They grow over like a hundred or a thousand years or something like that. Oh, I don't it know. Just, it's like so slow that it's considered non-renewable. Well, then I think like the fuel, you know, needed to harvest, mm. you know, it's like not a very good exchange. Sure. There. Uh, PT said, hey, you've been talking about summer plants in your containers. I'm in Colorado and my flowers are starting to look bad. So now I want to pull them out. Any ideas as to what to replace them? Uh, you could pop some perennials in at this point. I know like at my parents' garden center, they just got a new load of perennials this last week. I picked up a bunch of gorgeous echinacea, which you will see in a video maybe. No, it'll be after this one, probably. Um, anyway, a lot of places are kind of bringing in those late summer interest plants, rudbeckia and echinacea and uh, sedums, things like that, are beautiful in containers. I think that would be a really good option. Then you can pop them out later and um, enjoy them in your landscape. Uh, you can also just hang on for like one more month and fall plants will start showing up down at garden centers and things, and then you can refill them for fall. Why do you think that is that so many people have trouble once they're once their containers fill out and the heat hits, it's like a lot of people seem to really struggle with keeping their stuff alive. Why do you think that is? I don't, I, I don't know. I think, I think it's like it, a water it, issue where it could be, there's it, so much roots that are taking up the nutrients that you really kind of have to, like you have to go hard on fertilizer and water. Yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. And I don't know. I mean, because I've never really had, I mean, we have containers that poop out. Mm -hmm. we, do too, we do too. And you're not alone. Um, but you know, I've done the city planters downtown where the pots are on concrete. They're mm -hmm. getting exhaust from cars. They're out there in 110 degree temperatures looking amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's just because we like doused them mm -hmm. with water. I'd go through three tanks of, I don't, how big was my tank? 50 gallons? It was, uh, I thought mm, it, was, it was like 75 or a hundred. Yeah. I would wait until that water, I could see it below the pot. And those were massive pots. Mm. That's also a huge factor. The larger your pot, the more water reservoir. Don't fill your pots with other stuff yeah. in the bottom. Because and, of wicking. Yes. Unless you want to be a slave to watering later on. Um, and you know, we have put stuff like bark nuggets at the bottom of the container. It just messes up the drainage so bad. Um, Anyway, so the smaller the reservoir, the less water it's going to hang on to, and that extra water can act as a buffer when it gets really hot. And some plants will just wilt down during the day, and they need a little pick-me-up. I mean, mm -hmm. we see that here, and ours get it because we still get cool at night, like in the 60s. Next week, it's low 70s. But that's still like that 40, 30 to 40 degree swing really can benefit plants, and I know that doesn't help those of you in the south or you know those of you who don't cool off at night, and it could just be too much for things. Yeah. We, we have no experience in that kind right. of climate. So... That's kind of hard to say. For us, it's just a water issue. I've heard some of the people at Proven Winters talk about how plants kind of melt in the south where uh -huh. it doesn't cool down. Mm -hmm. Or they'll like refuse to bloom. Yeah. Because um, they just... Too much heat. Yeah, I just can't yeah. take it. Yeah. I did want to show you while we're still on the subject of the seeds that we planted. So in that video, I also planted some broccoli and cabbage. 
in these self-watering trays. So I watered them from the top that day and then filled the trays and I actually have not filled the trays again mm. since that day. In fact, yesterday I told my dad, oh, I planted two trays of seeds and I have not even checked on them, not one time since I... So anyway, and they're still pretty heavy. This one looks like it could use a little bit of moisture, but everything is doing really well. So I'm happy with that. That was the broccoli. And then you can see, I, I don't know if you can see, but the cabbage tray looks just about the same. And I had to start these in here because it's just too hot again to start them outside, but they need a longer season. Like you have to either start with starts that you picked up at a garden center, which my parents will bring them in um, eventually. But if I have them started in here and I can grow them on a little bit, then I can move them out to the greenhouse and then we can move them into the, the uh, garden a little bit later. Next video was trimming a way overgrown elderberry and some climbing roses. And I gotta say that was one of the more satisfying projects I have done in a while. So huge, massive, instant karma elderberry. I don't know how tall it is. It's Maybe probably two, eight to 10. ten. Somewhere in there. Right and it now. was that wide, yeah. for sure. It was over the walkway. And then the colette roses on the arbors on either end of the vegetable garden completely bloomed out uh, and completely bushy. It was very hard to get through the arbors and into the garden. We could only really access it from the front. Uh, so I just decided either this elderberry has to go, we got to dig it out and put something else here because this is inappropriate size for this area, or I can try to trim all the bottom out and kind of shave up the branches and make it into a tree, which, you know, several of the shrubs out of my parents' house are that way. I like plants that look like that anyway. I like to see some architecture. Um, I like the instant karma full though, too. We've got two on the other end of that same walkway, the same brick walkway that I let get to their full size, but I have planted them a little bit further away so they're not um, in the way. Mm -hmm. They're not in the way of anybody and that's the whole goal, goal is to plant things in the appropriate spot so that you don't create a whole bunch of work for yourself. Anyway, it turned out amazing. I really, really like how it opened up that area, gave me an opportunity to plant some other things in there and it just looks more pleasing, mm -hmm. looks more appropriate. Leslie said, I only have a wee garden here in Scotland, so I have pruned my black lace elderberry, viburnum, and smoke bush into trees. Gives me so much space underneath for planting. All of them are around eight feet tall, and I love them. Have a great day, everyone. It sounds a lot like my parents' garden. Mm -hmm. They have viburnums like that. Um, they have Rosa Sharon's that are shrub form, but they're multi like that. They've got, um, it's not a black, maybe it's a black lace. They've got a few elderberries that they've done that one. One's a Sutherland Gold, I know that. And then one's a dark color, but I can't remember. Is there like a Madonna mm. elderberry? Does that sound right? Anyway, um, yeah. Patty said, uh, love your hair, did you get highlights? Oh, I got it colored a long while ago. I don't know when that was. Like a couple, three months ago. Mm. I don't know. So I had more light put in my hair and it is wrecking my hair. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, my hair bleaches in the sun so badly anyway, and it usually kind of goes through the ringer in the summer because it's just exposed to the sun all day long. Um, but the addition of the, the blonde really has um, kind of made it a little bit tough. Anyway, I'm due for a hair color, as you can see, but I'll color it and it'll just turn copper penny again anyway from being out in the sun. I've never really stressed all that much about my hair because I'm always out in the garden. I'm never really around a lot of people. We don't like go to fancy things. Yeah, but you take care of your hair. Like it looks well, really nice ish. all the time. I mean, it's just, I know it's going to bleach out. And so I let a long time go between coloring mm. and I'm, I'm not fussy in that way. Mm. I don't think. You're a little fussy in that you won't put it up. You're like, I, I maybe you're like fussy in that you like your hair the same kind of all the time, which I like. I like that's the way you not, do your hair. That's not fussy, Erin. That's low maintenance. Yeah, but you do have to do your hair. Yeah. It does take you a little bit of time. Whereas, like, I think s some women just, like, put it up in a messy bun or, uh -huh. you know, put it in a hat or yeah. things like that. And mm -hmm. you typically don't do that. You pretty much, like, do your hair every day. I didn't do my hair today. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I didn't get very sweaty yesterday. So <laughs> this is second day hair. Okay. Uh, Margaret, I do shower. <laughs> I shower everybody. Uh, Margaret said, what kind of elderberry is this? Does not look anything like the black lace or lemon. Lemon. <clears throat> Choking on my own spit now. I am just class act over here. Are there any other kinds of elderberry? Yes, there are uh, the black lace, the black beauty, the straight laced, the lemony lace, the Sutherland gold. There's the regular, like the Nova and York, like the elderberry, the berry producing type, the best for berries. If you're uh, wanting to 
gather them. There's probably so many other varieties of elderberry out there that I'm not even aware of. Megan said, love the videos. Everything is so inspiring. Your work ethic is hugely motivating and I admire your and Aaron's intentionality and what you share and don't share. Question for you, how do you manage slash handle ticks, black flies, and mosquitoes? I rarely see gardeners talk about the less desirable aspects of gardening such as this, but I know it happens. I always do a tick check before I come inside in southern New Hampshire. You know, black flies aren't a thing here that I know of, are they? No. No. Ticks are a thing, but not where, not immediately where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and then mosquitoes are a huge thing. Aaron got a... Flotron. A zapper. Is it Floatron? Yeah. Is that right? I love it. It looks real nice. I would night buy like five or six light. more and put them throughout the garden. Oh my goodness, with the blue lights glowing. I just love the sound of hearing the zapper go um, off death. like constantly. Mosquito death. Yeah, because you just, uh, it just mm -hmm. feels good. It's kind of like when um, when you kill some hornets or something like that that are... Grasshoppers. Earwigs. Uh, I don't really care about grasshoppers. Earwigs. I guess. Yeah, earwigs, earwigs I like worst. to be dead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We also have a lot, they're not, um, they don't hurt anything, but those elm seed beetles yeah. uh, or box oh. elder bugs, which are, what are they? They're an elm seed beetle. Elm seed beetle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have millions of them and yeah. it feels like every Literally. time I walk in the house, it's like they fall when you open the door or yeah. something. They're like the type that can squeeze in between yeah. the tiniest crack and you'll find them like in picture frames in yeah. your house. They'll, you, they'll get but, in between your windows Yeah, and they'll be in, not on the inside or the outside, just chilling in the middle. Like yeah. somehow they got in there. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense how yeah. they get around. Um, but it usually lasts for about a month, maybe a month and a half. It's kind of like the horde descends yeah. and then they kind of dissipate through mm -hmm. the rest of the season. The mosquitoes, we just have to spray ourselves with the mosquito repellent. Teresa said, have you been to Victoria and walked through Bouchard Gardens? That was where we went on our honeymoon. See, it set the stage Yeah. for, Boom. for the garden job. Um, my husband and I took a quick trip up here after a family wedding in central Washington. It is phenomenal, absolutely extraordinary. extraordinary. I think you would love it. We did love it. Martha said, love the new look of the elderberry. Will you just let the upper branches grow or trim them down in the spring? I'll probably trim them a bit um, just to kind of help maintain shape and not have anything get too long or out of control up top. Plus, I think I'll have to thin some out anyway because I didn't thin any out at this time because I feel like they've created such a network of support for one another at this point of the season that if I were to, to um, take some of those out, the other ones that were left may not be quite strong enough to hold up to our wind. So that's probably what I'll do. Uh, Lacey said, I have a question about pruning a climbing rose. I have one growing over an arbor and once it gets to the top, there's a lot of new growth emerging straight up from the stalks. Should I prune them off? Are they considered suckers or try to get them to lay down on top of the arbor so they grow horizontally with the rest of the plant? Um, I hope this makes sense. So you've got growth coming off of your main growth cane, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. You can cut those down to where it's like above the first set of leaves just so you have like little like growth spurs almost to where they will create blooms off of those. You can do that if you want to cut them back or cut them all the way, not all the way flush, but you know, cut them pretty close to that main cane if you want to eliminate some. You don't want things to get like so massively thick. Um, so you kind of want to be selective about what you leave. That's what I would do. Next video was repotting a 200 year old Christmas cactus. A customer before my mom's mishap with her leg actually <laughs> brought a 200, they say it's a 200 year old Christmas cactus. Allegedly. I've, yeah, I have no way to confirm that because we were like counting back how far 200 years is and I'm like... Like pre-Civil War, uh, you know? Yeah, like is this the original root ball or is this a rooted cutting or did somebody in your family just tell you it was old? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was big yeah. and it was incredibly root bound, but it hasn't been repotted in 17 years. That part, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just now starting to see little signs of stress. And that's probably what I would do. You know, most guides will tell you repot every three to four years. Um, but if nothing is wrong with your plant, I probably wouldn't mess with it. Unless like your plant's not taking moisture anymore and this one was not. Like I couldn't even get that root ball to take moisture when I submerged the bare root ball in water. Mm -hmm. Just sat there yeah, right. until I started to open it up a little bit. So um, yeah, your plant will like pull, the soil will pull away from the sides because it's just all roots. It may stop taking water. You'll see signs of stress in the leaves. It'll stop blooming and so on and so forth. Uh, anyway, it was a whew, kind of a nerve wracking thing. First of all, we went down and picked it up at the garden center and we, it was on a cart mm -hmm. and a garden cart. And we thought, how are we going to get this to the house? Because it's way easier to do. If we're going to film a project, it's way easier to do it here. 
um, down there we would be in the way. People get uncomfortable when there are cameras around. We don't want to create any kind of a scene. So we picked the whole cart up, put it in the back of the truck, and I put a piece of shade cloth over the top of it and tied it to the cart. And we brought it up here, dr driving really slow, and then got it in inside. Ended up having to break the pot off of it after trying a few other things, but it was pretty satisfying. We yeah. didn't look wildly different than when we very first started the project, but it was interesting. Pam said, oh my, would have been a nervous wreck repotting that monster. I was on the edge of my seat hoping you could get it out of the pot without breaking anything off. But, but of course you did it with such grace. You teach us all so much more than just gardening. Persistence, positivity, and a can-do attitude are among many. Thank you once again for all you do to shine a bright light on, on us all and for us and for making this a better world. That's really sweet. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Julie said, would you say it formed a shell around the root ball? It looks like cardboard. It did look like cardboard. In fact, initially I thought, oh, those are roots. And then I started thinking, is that like a peat pot mm. inside the terracotta pot? And then I got to looking at it closer and it was just a network of like fine roots. It was just crazy. And it was the exact shape of the terracotta pot that it was, you know, came out of. Just crazy. Kate said, I would love to see this glorious beast in bloom. Did the owner say what color the flowers are? Yes, they are a salmon pink. Madonna said, what do you feed the Christmas cactus and is it the same food for the Thanksgiving and Easter cactus? I love this video, very interesting. So I would feed the same thing to Christmas, Thanksgiving or Easter and I've got the fertilizer somewhere here. Yeah, there it is. This is what I would use right here. And you usually start in, oh, when you see fresh growth in the spring, which could be like February, March, and then you can do once a month until about middle of the summer. So it's only gonna get like three, maybe applications of fertilizer. Honestly, if I get to three applications of fertilizer, if that was my plant, that would be lucky for that plant. <laughs> um, but that's probably the regimen I would put it on. Debbie said that cactus is awesome. So cool and you did a great job repotting it. Thank you. How often do you water these type of cactus? More often than like your desert type cactus because these just, they, need, they require more water. It's kind of like I have a rickrack cactus in here um, or a zigzag cactus and I do water it probably every two weeks or so, which is way more often than I would water like a barrel cactus or something like that. Uh, they just need more. They also have to have indirect bright light, not full sun, and um, that tends to scorch their leaves. Marilyn said, how you know it's 200 years old? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know for sure. I was just going off what the customer said, and the customer is always right. <laughs> Barbara said, do you recommend terracotta pots over ceramic pots? How does one prepare a pot for repotting? Well, for cactus and succulents and those type of things, I would recommend terracotta pots because they breathe. Uh, ceramic pots have this like the color coating glaze on the outside, which does not allow the oxygen exchange. It just, um, it tends to keep the plants a little bit happier in my experience anyway. Next video is freshening up a perennial bed and planting lots of Veronica. So I took after the area underneath that elderberry, ended up adding in a pillar with a container, which is still empty by the way. I love the way it looks over there. It's kind of a restful look. And then I added some wildberry hookera, um, fall in love sweetly anemone, and then iris that used to be behind where the Hartley is. So I finally got through that big chunk of iris that Chad dug up and just kind of left there. I asked him if he could just scrape one chunk of iris up and I would eventually plant it. So it took me till July to get that done. Um, but I think it turned out really pretty. I'm really, really loving it. And in the process, I had dug out five white wands Veronica out of that area that just didn't quite fit in the way I wanted it to. I moved those out to the South Garden as well as planting out some Purple Illusion and Pink p pink Potion, I think. Veronica. That sounds right. Does that sound right? I get the, it's the pink perfusion salvia, right? Oh yeah. I get those two, so the names just uh, messed up. I love both of the plants. Uh, Jamie said, is the peony cage from Gardener Supply? Oh, yeah, so that is the top of one of the obelisks that we had previously in the raised bed vegetable garden. They were from Gardener Supply. They're like the, what are they called? Hang on, that's gonna bug me. They are the, is it Hart, Hardin, Jardin, Jardin, Jar, Jardin, J-A-R-D-I-N. Jardinier. Jardinier, that's what Unique Stone calls their Jardiniers. Jardinier pots. Mm -hmm. This is a Jardin round obelisk. That does not sound right. Harden round? Harden, I don't know. It's like garden, but like, 
French or something. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, it's the around obelisk from Gardner Supply. I got the five foot, no, yeah. And it doesn't matter what, how high they were. They bent eventually. They were in the garden for a long time. I had some really heavy tomatoes in them one year and the wind caught the canopy of the tomatoes and kind of bent the trellis a little bit. And so the tops were all fine though. So I just popped the tops off and I'm using them as little cages out in the flower bed. I love that they can kind of live on because they're such a pretty shape. Olive said, I've noticed that some of your plants have a drip system set up only on one side of them. Is it okay if the other side of the plant isn't watered? The water kind of subs out all over the place. Mm -hmm. So we find it just fine. Unless it's a large tree, we do want to make sure that like water reaches um, multiple sides of the root ball. So we'll put like two emitters, one on either side, or we'll run a uh, ring of drip around the root ball to make sure it's got good coverage. Michelle said, I planted a drift of white wands Veronica last year and this year they came up beautifully. However, they are flopping. Any idea why this may be? Um, are they done blooming? At this point, if they're flopping and done blooming, I would shear them back and let them come back fresh. That's what I would do. Too much water or fertilizer? Not, I don't know on Veronica if they react that way. Mm. I know sedums react that way or Russian sage. I wouldn't imagine Veronica would. I mean, I suppose it's possible. I would cut them back though if they're done blooming mm -hmm. so that they, I need to do that with some of mine so that they come back fresh. Debbie said, how about putting a bench or benches in those areas? Oh, the empty areas on, on the maple side. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've thought about it, but I think that that would be adding too much in the space. You know what I mean? Like just too much, too much going on um, in terms of not hardscape, but ornamental things in the garden, I guess. Um, I was a little bit nervous about even putting that pillar, and I think I expressed that in the video. I was nervous about putting the pillar there because I did not want it to distract or be too much with the great big esplanade urns that are mm -hmm. right in that same area. I'm about kind of um, highlighting the beauty of the pieces that are there and not overdoing it. Uh, thankfully, all of those things are kind of a movable thing, so I guess I could get a bench and try it, like just put it out there yeah. uh, without investing in a whole bunch because we can move a, be a bench anywhere in the garden. Might be nice over time as the trees get larger because yeah. you'll be sitting in the shade. Right. Well, and as the boxes get bigger too, mm -hmm. they'll kind of maybe mask the bench. I yeah. just don't, looking over it right now, I just don't want it to look like too much going on. Lisa said, how is your no-dig garden with the cardboard going? Well. Yeah. Um, it's not really an area that we're spending a lot of time in. There's no weeds or stuff, you know, yeah. things coming up. Where we planted that double file viburnum though, mm -hmm. do you remember, I don't know if, I mean, we did it on video, I think. It was the hardest hole, I think, ever. Yeah, yeah, in right. In the history of this property, I think it was the hardest hole. Well, that I, whole area back there used to be a gravel walkway, and I wonder if it got compacted but down. before that, it was a pasture. It wasn't a gravel walkway for that long. No, but if it got compacted, I mean, if they actually ran a, a compactor on it and then put you think so? gravel, I don't know if they did that, but oh, that seems like a lot of, yeah, you just never know with know, whoever yeah. did, did projects. How... I couldn't dig the hole. You had to yeah, come in and do it. Right. Yeah. There's an occasion where I have to ask Aaron, like, I can't do this. I like, I literally, I cannot push on this drill hard enough mm -hmm. and I could smell the drill. Right. Start to, I could smell that hot, like smoke the smell coming kind of from the motor. Yeah. No good. Playlist said, how do you keep your delphiniums alive? I love them, but they all die suddenly. That's not good. No, that's not good at all. I mean, mine flop over because I had never staked mine properly, but they usually grow really well. I, I don't know if it's an environmental thing. Um, keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, keep them well watered. We um, have ours, they're in a drip system, so they get consistent water. Uh, I try to keep mine in areas where they're not gonna be especially exposed to wind. Um, I cut them back after they've either flopped or, you know, the blooms are spent and they usually flush back beautifully. So yeah. Next video is 10 perennials that look really great in the heat. I just thought it would be a good opportunity to walk through our own gardens and show you some things that are looking really nice. I mean, these perennials that are either, you know, some, most of them that I showed you are only a couple of years old. Um, if that, I showed you some one year plants versus the second year on Russian sage and on echinacea. It's pretty incredible the difference. I'm really proud of some of those things out there that have just done so well. It always makes me feel like validated in my plant choice for those areas <laughs> in a way. Um, anyway, it was hot that day. I think it was 101, which that's hot. I know that's not as hot as some of you guys have been. Um, and I was just like sweating, just standing there and my camera, it shut off like every three minutes. Yeah. I had three batteries. I usually, I usually wear like button ups in the garden cause they're really like big and easy to move in. 
Um, and, and they cover, like, you know. Cover yourself? Yeah. I could be wearing things that are probably more flattering, but it doesn't matter. It's a garden, right? Anyway, they usually have a pocket right here, and I had three batteries in my pocket, and so every three minutes I'd have to stop take the battery out of the camera, I like blow, like blow off the heat out of the camera and then I would swap a new battery in. And I just had to keep doing that over and over and over again. I was getting a little bit frustrated. <laughs> if anyone has recommendations, like, but experience mm -hmm. with ca like operating cameras that are small and easily movable mm -hmm. in uh, like over a hundred degree heat in the sun. That don't me, turn off. That let me know. Yes, please. Sherry said, I live in Texas right outside of Fort Worth, 109 the Oof. last couple days. I should not complain about 101 with high humidity. I really need things to grow and thrive. Thank you for showing that things besides humans can grow in such harsh environments. Four years ago, I found your channel with zero plants outside. Now we have a beautiful living space because you gave me the confidence to grow again. Oh. I was raised in a floral shop in uh, Pamp Pampa? Pampa, Texas, 60 years ago, and lost the ability to love what I was trying to grow when I started my own place to grow. You have touched so many lives, both young and old. Thank you for sharing your sweet family and love of growing all things, even broken hearts who happen upon your channel. Much love and good vibes to you and your family. Dang. Really sweet. Yeah, Sherry, that was really nice. Thank you. Ellen said, are all these plants proven winners? If so, I'm putting my order in. <laughs> Can we still plant? A lot of them were. Some of them weren't. Mm -hmm. You know, many of the echinaceas weren't. Um, I did like honorable mentions with the Agastache and the Coreopsis, which should have been in the video, but those are not proven winners. Um, there was a mixed bag, really. Yeah. But a lot of them, uh, I don't know if it was 50-50. Maybe it was 60-40. Yeah. Yeah. Heather said, which of these would you recommend for a really hot spot? I have a dahlia next to the house and it gets the morning to midday sun and it appears the radiant heat bouncing off the building is just too much for it. Put Russian sage there or sedum, an upright sedum. It'll do it for you. Kathy said, every once in a while you mention plants that don't want to be fertilized. Could you maybe do a video to educate us? We talked about that, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we totally should do that. Yeah. That's yeah, a that's great a, idea that for video. That is a really good idea. Kara D said, how many daisy maize are in the grouping by the raised bed vegetable garden? Two. That's it. It's amazing. They're an amazing plant. Uh, Trixie said, question about perennials in the sleep creep leap cycle. So first year they sleep, second year they creep, and the, the third year they leap. That's pretty true of most everything. If I transplanted a bunch of two-year-old plants, will they regress back to the sleep year? I was really looking forward to the leap next year, but these had to be moved because of a lost tree. Ah, uh, yeah, it'll set them back a bit. Maybe not 100%. You might get more growth out of them as you would have, you know, that first initial year, um, but it'll definitely play a role in setting them back. Linda said, how do you keep yarrow from laying down and sprawling? I have several colors and they all want to lay down. Again, I think that could be a breed. Mm -hmm. uh, a variety issue. A variety issue. Um, a lot of things have been bred to be stronger, better plants. They're trialed up next to a bunch of other varieties in the field and they just see, you know, over the years, which ones hold up better and don't do the flopping thing and don't like denim and lace russian sage com, like different plant but a lot of russian sages flop a mm -hmm. lot of them do and a lot of it's due to not getting enough sun or getting too much water or fertilizer um they'll flop in those cases but sometimes plants just will flop because mm -hmm. they flop um and this one doesn't a lot of like it just stays nice and like dense and compact and strong uh deanna said this is so helpful i'm in utah oh i'm sorry let me go back to the yarrow thing you can cut yours back um, and let it reflush. I usually don't cut mine back because I like the look of the spent blooms. I like to use them in all different stages of bloom. So I just leave mine alone. But if yours are flopping right at this point of the season, you still have time to cut them back and they'll reflush for you and be a much denser plant. Deanna said, this is so helpful. I'm in Utah where we're burning up with this heat and no rain most of the summer. Do these plants get water from your drip system? If so, how often? We run our drips in the hottest part of the summer once a day. Um, we adjust the drip depending on, you know, if it's windy or if we have a cooler day. Like today, actually, I think for the next three days, we're just under 100 degrees. Mm. It's amazing the difference that just... Yeah, I noticed it this morning. I actually yeah. didn't know that it was supposed to be under 100, but uh -huh. I came out this morning and I was like, oh, there's like a little... It was a breeze. Little breeze, yeah. And I actually, like, I purposed to get up early. I came out real early to figure out, like, what I wanted to get done. Um, in my pajamas. I was kind of like hoping nobody was outside. <laughs> anyway, um, I went out here or I came out here, got all prepped and then I got outside early because I thought it was going to be hot, but it was a really pleasant 
planting project yeah. this morning. And I am planting the next couple of days, taking advantage of the... I'm pretty, with our system, um, especially like this spring, I turned off the drips a lot. Yeah. Like, they didn't run hardly at all this mm -hmm. spring when it was so rainy. Yeah. So it, for us, it's like if we're not getting rain, which during our summer, we go for quite a spell mm -hmm. where we don't get any rain. And I generally will run it every day. Uh -huh. um, spring was amazing this year. So much moisture. Um, it's like the good kind of moisture. Like I really feel like when when we get rain, the plants perk up better than they do if you water well, them I yourself. Think, I think too they get that overhead wash, and it's not from yeah, our hard right, water. Right. It's like good rainwater. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's something different about it. Somebody said it's more acid based, like it's more acidic. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe our plants are like, oh, finally. <laughs> I feel like most plants, the majority of them, prefer more acid. Yeah. Next and last video for this week's recap is dead boxwoods and beautiful new daisies. So I had to replace some of the dead boxwoods in our east side containers that just didn't thrive. Um, I also planted two new varieties of daisy. One was called Real Charmer and the other one's called Luna and they're doing really great despite the heat. I planted, I can't remember how hot it was that day, 103 or something like that. They look amazing. Uh, it's all about hydration. Watering them before you put them in the ground, like water them in their can really well so you're putting a wet root ball in the ground and then just water them in that day and then the drip picks up and takes off mm -hmm. and I you normally don't have to go out and water them by hand again. What else did I do? Oh I planted up the pot by the incredible hydrangeas. That wicker one. I'm like trying to, I'm struggling to remember what I put in there. Super bells. I had some leftover stuff and it was all kind of like a stressed stuff a little bit but it looks pretty to have a little spot of color there. A Garden Revive said anxiously watching this before surgery today Ooh, so I can breathe better. So much prep for it though. Got all the flower beds set up on drip and got almost everything planted. A few things left but it should be fine while I'm out. Can't wait to see my garden in two weeks hoping for a faster recovery. Also the daisy may look gorgeous in that spot. Mine are four dinky little quart sized ones. I have faith in them though. Well, I hope that your surgery went really, really well and that your recovery is amazing and quick and that you aren't in a lot of pain. Dang it, but I'm glad that you feel good about your garden. That is a huge thing. When you are down, if you either have somebody taking care of your stuff for you or a system in place that is kind of picking up where you can't do it, that really does ease the brain a lot, especially when it's something that you've cared for and that you're, you know, it's your thing. You don't want it to suffer. Megara, Megara said, can you do a tutorial on how to put together a cut flower arrangement? I've never done it and I would be interested in the basic steps approach to it. We should. Dahlias mm -hmm. are just starting to bloom a little bit more consistently. Uh, I've, I've, I mean, I could do it at any point. There's a lot of beautiful things out there. And the cut flower shed, you will see this video. You'll probably see that video next week, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. I did go in there and organize it and cleaned it up and it makes me feel a lot better. Before, I just had stuff on crates everywhere. I hadn't had a chance to go through them all. And so now you can actually walk around the table. That makes a difference when you can, you know, move about your spaces better. Norma said, I have a lot of clay in my ground. What can I do to fix it? Just add a lot of organic matter in, as much compost as you can. Uh, keep adding it in. And gypsum works really good to help kind of break up any Gypsum works really well. It does, but it's a consistency thing again with gypsum. It's not that expensive. You can buy gypsum in bulk. What, mm -hmm. like, what does a 50 pound bag of it cost? Well, if you buy the powdered, it was like, well, this is when I worked there, but I think it was like $8.99 for a 50 pound powder, not the pelletized. Mm -hmm. Pelletized was more. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're just working it into beds and not, don't try to spread powder on a lawn. I did that once. Yeah. What, a, what a dumb thing. <laughs> I put it in a broadcast spreader and it was such a mess. And then my spreader, which I was using a tiny one, that little Scotts one yeah. in our old yard, because our, our grass was up. tiny. Well, it, it was getting all caught in the spreader thing. And then the wheel cut, it was just like plastic wheels. The wheel cut like an edge and the whole thing tipped over. <sighs> so I just had this giant power pile of white powder sitting on top of the grass. So I just had to pick up handfuls and like, toss it. Yeah, and do that, which is totally fine. You can't really hurt things with gypsum, which is another great thing. But if you're working it into your area, your flower beds, just get the powder, work it in, work in lots of organic matter. Spread leaves on your flower beds in the fall. That works so well, especially if you can like put them through the lawnmower first, break them up a little bit, put leaves and a little bit of blood meal on there to help like speed up leaf decomposition. And you can kind of almost have like a little mini com uh, compost pile right mm -hmm. there on top of your flower beds. But it's, it's diligence and co consistency on all of those things. Clay is tough. Storybrook Soap Co. said, what is the DeWalt auger combo you are using? Is it the DeWalt concrete mixture? Yes. 
with an auger bit. What size of auger was I using? It was a five inch one, I think. Hmm. And that's what I used this morning. It is awesome. So we have, we have lots of different augers. We use consistently the nine inch, seven inch, five inch, and then that's like a three and a half inch or something like that. I think the I think it's three inch, three inch for annuals. All of them are three feet tall, mm -hmm. I think. They stand three feet tall, which is amazing. So I don't have to bend way over. Um, the five inch I use for one gallon size cans. And what I do is when I'm auging the hole, I kind of like rock the auger back and forth in the hole and it widens it out just a little bit more. Works great. That concrete mixer drill is amazing mm -hmm. for auging. Yeah, I think I've said it before, but like if I was a landscaper, uh -huh. I don't know what else you would use. I know, They're, it's so nice and it's lighter weight than that stud and joist drill was, it was all I could do to hoist that thing yeah. around. And I'm not like especially weak, I could be stronger, but, but it was a lot, Yeah, it was a lot. Aaron said, so inspirational, thank you. Any idea why some of the boxwoods died? I just think they were all a little bit struggling with spider mites. The sprinters worse than the winter gems, which is kind of what we found throughout our landscape. Um, so the sprinters went first and then I didn't get giant root balls on all the boxwoods when I tried to dig them up. Some of them came up without huge root balls. And so I, I kind of thought that some of them may not survive. So I think it was probably that I did the transplanting in the fall so they didn't have an enormous time to form a new root system before winter hit and that was probably another reason why they struggled but you know the whole thing i just figured i really wasn't out much it was better than going and buying you know 14 brand new it for those size of pots you need enormous things mm -hmm. for it to look appropriately scaled and i was like why well, i have 14 boxes in the ground that need to be moved like what are the odds of that happening and i can tuck the four that are a different variety at the end and then do the 10 winter gems for the rest of the distance and i just kind of knew i might lose some of them which is fine if we can just get them through this winter and have a winter arrangement great so in the end i will have a few to put in the landscape which will be nice um yeah Janice said, what was the brand of those first Shasta Daisies featured? I wasn't sure if they were proven winners. Neither of those were, no, neither of those were. One of them was a, the Real Charmer. Uh, that was the first one I showed, the great big one. Those are two that just caught my eye when I was down at the garden center. So those, uh, that was like a blooming nursery can, yeah. which is the can of the grower. It's not yeah, like a, it's it's not not a brand, brand name. No brand, yeah. Yeah. D like does, that's what's a little confusing to me. That I don't really understand is it's like, there are certain breeders who like, I think that they sell the the rights to people to grow it. Like, anyone can grow it, but mm -hmm. you have to pay a royalty or something like that oh. to the breeder. Or or it's just baked into the cost of of them buying the seeds. Mm -hmm. Or I don't really understand how that works. Because, like, Proven Winners owns all their own plants. Mm -hmm. Or at least I think they do. Mm -hmm. um, like, they own the rights to them. Mm -hmm. But not everybody else does like i know monrovia is a huge grower mm -hmm. and they don't own the rights to a lot of the stuff that they grow mm -hmm. um so like are they paying royalties or or do they just grow things that are open varieties that anyone can do i need someone to like sit down and explain that whole thing <laughs> yeah. the whole garden industry is is really complicated and we've been to involved me. in it yeah. for years and we're still like I don't, right. I don't know what's going on here i just want to plant things in my garden and not have to worry about this, yeah which is what i do for the most part yeah so Anyway, those just caught my eye and I was excited to get some something different out there. And the last question is from Dawn. Do you still use the water soluble fertilizer once a week or did you move to the time release? Nope. We tried to use flower tone. We were trying to get away with out doing the weekly water soluble thing because we have an enormous amount of annuals. And so it's a lot of fertilizer and it's a lot of work. It's a lot mm -hmm. of time to do it. Um, Anyway, a couple of things. So first off, we tried flower tone, the Spoma flower tone, which works awesome if you can get the fertilizer to the soil. Mm -hmm. um, it also does not have the chelated iron in it, which the Proven Winners Water Soluble has the EDDHA chelated iron. That's super important. There's a couple different types, types of chelated iron. It's the EDDHA that's the type that works for the plants in the way we need it to work uh, with high pH soils. If you have lower pH soil, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. You can right. use any chelated iron. Right. Or probably any iron, period. Sure. Um, so we tried the flower tone, our plants just didn't do as well because they weren't, they were maybe getting some of the nutrients with the stuff that would make it down. It's just that when later on in the season, the plant canopy is so thick that mm -hmm. it's hard to get through without wrecking the plants to get stuff down to the soil. Um, and then again, we would have to treat with chelated iron anyway. Mm -hmm. So we just went back to the weekly water soluble. We have a 150 gallon tank mm -hmm. on a trailer 
we have a generator, a little generator, mm -hmm. right, hooked up. You know this better than I do. Yeah, so this year we've got the best setup yes. of all the years. We kept trying to do an electric solution and we couldn't get an electric motor that was strong enough to, to run the pumps. So anyway, to get like good enough pressure. So now we have a little Honda generator and it, they're pretty quiet. They're not that loud. Mm -hmm. And then it runs to a pump. I talked to a pump guy in our area um, and he got us the pump that we need and it has the best pressure of any hose on our property. So like yeah. when you turn it on, it just, it waters quickly. Cause when you're fertilizing, you want it to go quick. You don't want it to be just like trickling out of the hose. Yeah. Oh, there's nothing worse. I've been at the back end of a hose that trickles like that. Yeah. It just takes oh, forever. If you, you just get through your job quicker, if it just comes out. So it works, it works awesome. Now we can, I fill it up with um, iron. Like just today I was out putting iron on some things and I just pour the iron, the chelated iron powder in there, mix it up in the water Looks tank. Looks like blood coming out of yeah, the it does. water wand. Um, and then Paul's been doing the fertilizing every Thursday, like every Thursday, mm -hmm. pretty much the whole thing he's been doing. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll do a video about it um, in the next week or two. Yeah. And I'll show you our setup. I mean, it's intense and probably not. <laughs> it's not, so nice though now because yeah. we can pull it with the gator. We can pull yeah. the trailer with the gator and so you can get in. You can pull it with places. whatever you have. Like that's yeah. the whole point. We don't have to hook it up to a, a the a truck, truck or anything. which is what we were doing. Um, also the hose, there's a hose link on oh, it. Oh yeah, we, two actually. There is? Well, so I had um, a welder that we know uh, mount a post on both sides because I wasn't sure if we wanted it on the front or the back. Mm -hmm. We ended up using the hose on the front mm -hmm. more. Um, but yeah, the hose link is amazing because you yeah. can just retract it back in, move on, and then go somewhere else. And... The initial hose we had on there was so awful. <laughs> Well, the yeah. reel only went out one way yeah. and I mean, you know, when you're pulling a hose out, you need it to be able to do this a little bit. You need it to be able to swing as you're pulling and the hose itself, we could have swapped this out, but it felt like one of those dram ones. <laughs> you hate the dram I hoses. I hate those hoses so much. Um, they have like the ridges or something yeah. like nothing hurts my hand more yeah. than and my hands are pretty tough because I don't wear gloves, right. but I just do not like those hoses at all. And so. Yeah, Which is the, funny because you're, you're a fan of a lot of other DRAM stuff. I love like their, water their water wands and their watering cans. Yeah. yeah there's one right there. Um, yeah. I just don't like those hoses. Yeah. So <laughs> everybody has their own thing though, right? You might right. love that hose. And that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Um, it was like supposed to be a non kink hose Yeah. and it kinked as the guy was like yeah, we showing us. Yeah, we were at us. a show and it was the DRAM. This is like early on. Yeah. Like 2016. Yeah. Um, or 15. And the guy was trying to sell us on these hoses. And so he like wheeled one out in the middle of the aisle of all these booths yeah. was showing us how it was no kink. And I'm like, you have like six kinks in that hose. Yeah. We just have to shake it. Yeah. I'm like, well, you can do that with any hose. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want to pay. I don't know how much they cost, but yeah. Oh, they're also really bright colors. They do appear like I know a lot of, um, growers use them because they're really heavy duty mm -hmm. and they market them as like lifetime though. hoses. Yeah, they are really heavy. And I, I tend to believe that they probably are pretty heavy duty in terms of lasting. I would rather use the Gilmore gray, the heavy duty. And just replace ones. it. Well, more they, often. they're, they're pretty tough though. The, yeah, they the are. The big ones. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, I would rather use those that are smooth, yeah. honestly. And they're gray. They kind of just blend into the landscape, which I really, I know yeah. everybody again is different in that way, but I like those types of practical things that you need to use in the garden. I don't really want them to like, like here's yeah. my hose, bright yeah. purple or bright Well, pink. the hose link, they kind of stick out in the garden a little bit, but it's just, it's too useful. Yeah. You know, it's like one of those I resisted, things. you guys, I resisted hard on the hose links for a while because I didn't want a plastic shroud out in the mm. garden. I didn't, I didn't want that. So we tried them by the greenhouse first. Green, there's one in the greenhouse and one right next to the barn. And they're so, so nice that I'm kind of like, I don't know what I'd do without them now. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of you guys have used them and try them too. And it looks like that is it for this week's recap video. That went really fast, I feel like. Yeah, it seemed like it. My goodness. You have any thoughts to add? Go plant a tree. There you go. Thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you in the next one. Bye.